In my opinion, Creative is one of the stranger companies in the history of computing. They've been a known brand for over 30 years, but the majority of what they've done has not been particularly notable, which is weird given how they started out. Creative became a massive name in the 90s when they produced the Sound Blaster, the first useful sound card for the PC, and in my opinion, we owe them a tremendous debt for that. Other companies had plenty of opportunity to make good PC sound cards throughout the 80s, and they didn't. There were crappy cards, and there were overwrought or expensive cards, but nobody made a good, affordable, general-purpose sound card. Now, we can't ever know how history would have gone if it didn't go the way that it went, but it's my experience that industry could ignore incredibly obvious products for as long as they like, no matter how much money they're leaving on the table. So I feel that if the Sound Blaster hadn't come out when it did, it easily could have taken another decade for PCs to get good audio. So Creative definitely earned their place in history, but what have they done since like 1993? Well, per their website, they do still make sound cards and sound card accessories. They make internal and external cards, headphones, sound bars, Bluetooth speakers, a lot of the other kind of sludge that most companies produce now that consumer technology has reached its end game. And to be honest, I'm kind of surprised they're still around at all. Audio is a pretty solved problem. Every PC for the last 20 years is shipped with at least stereo sound built in, and most come with surround sound and speed if and all the rest. And you know, maybe those sound chips aren't the best, but 99% of consumers will never know or care about that. Most of them will never use surround sound or speed if either. Hell, for an awful lot of people, it's all moot since they're using speakers or headphones with USB interfaces that provide their own DAC. So sound cards seem like a pretty niche market to me these days, and it's been that way for a while, and not just because of built-in audio. I feel like really after the first couple Sound Blaster models came out, Creative had maybe a couple years of market dominance, and then clones and other competition appeared that all did what they did, cheaper and good enough for most people. So even by the mid-90s, Creative had started dipping into many other markets. By 1996, they were selling pretty much all the same stuff they are now, with a few unusual outliers, like their lineup of internal modems, which they called Modem Blaster, or the uh, Creative Prada Keys, which combined a PC keyboard and a MIDI keyboard into one unit. You've probably seen that before, if you're on the internet. This is rock and roll. Double bass. Mostly, however, they stuck to the multimedia and gaming theme. They made speakers, game pads, 3D accelerators, MPEG decoders, all that sort of stuff. And then, at the very tail end of their product line, probably less well-remembered than anything else they made, were the CD-ROMs. As far back as 1992, they were selling drives under their own brand name, starting with basic single-speed caddy loaders, and they continued all the way up into the 2000s. They even made DVD-ROMs and MPEG-2 decoders to go with them, although that's a subject for another video. Now, I admit I don't know much about how CD-ROM drives are developed, so I can't really say whether any of these had distinguishing features. I've always assumed that there were only three or four actual companies making drives and then a million others just rebranding them. Maybe that's true, maybe not, but I have a hard time imagining that Creative was bringing that much to the table. I mean, how much can you really do to make a CD-ROM drive special? The two possible functions are to read CD-ROMs and play audio discs. That's just about it. And by the late 90s, those were both solved problems. Anyone could buy a drive, plug it into an IDE port right next to their hard drive, and it would pop up in Windows. Every drive, no matter how cheap. The only real exception was if you bought a drive so bad that it simply didn't work at all, and in my experience, that just didn't happen. I owned at least one drive that was so cheap that the drawer fell out the third time I ejected it, but it would still read discs if you just stuck the drawer back in. I kept using it for a few months. I mean, <laughs> these things were pretty bulletproof. So there really wasn't that much that could stand out about any given CD-ROM. Over the course of the 90s, they did, of course, get a lot faster, uh, over 50 times faster, in fact. But besides that, a CD-ROM was pretty much just a CD-ROM, no matter which one you bought. For instance, if we look at this box for a Creative CD Blaster 52X, it offers no unique selling points. It says it runs at 52 speed, which other drives could do. It says you could compile clear, crisp digital music from CD tracks, which everything else could do too. It's impossible for a CD-ROM not to do that. The only thing that seems to stand out here is Audio Excel, which ostensibly lets you rip CD audio digitally at 20 speed. I have to admit that might be a unique feature, assuming you could get digital audio extraction to work anyway, since that was a perennially unreliable feature. You might be able to rip your music collection on this drive faster than on the competition, but 
it's still a very niche feature and it wasn't likely to make you grab this one over another drive that cost $30 less. It does, however, at least suggest that Creative may actually have been designing their drives themselves instead of just stamping their name on generic products from some other company, so at least there's that. But even if they were putting their backs into it, it's just a tough row to hoe. As with a lot of PC features, it's not clear what you could conceivably add. CD-ROM drives are tools. It's the stuff on the disk that you want. The drive is just a means to get at it. If you went into a room with a few designers and engineers and kicked the concept of a CD-ROM around the table for a couple of days, you'd be hard pressed to walk out with anything more than idle doodles on your notepad. And yet, Creative apparently went into that room and managed to walk out with some kind of W. These two drives here are some of those results. Uh, this is the Creative CD5222E, uh, also known as the Digital IR, and this is the CD5220. And I'd love to say that these are the only CD-ROMs in history that didn't look exactly like all the other ones. I can't, but only because Creative made a bunch more before these. This product line actually started in 1996 or 97 with the Creative Infra 1800, sometimes called the Blaster CD 1800. And you can see this was not a high-end product. Uh, it was only $170, so it was one of the cheaper drives you could find that wasn't a total white box. And yet, it was the most unique drive on the market. It wasn't a CD burner, it wasn't a DVD-ROM, but it still had features that nothing else had. Uh, in fact, Creative apparently sold these for at least five years with pretty much that same feature set, other than improved speeds. Uh, they had the Infra 2400, 4800, 6000, and finally the 52X, which all seemed to be very similar other than their transfer rates. After the 52X, Creative dropped the Infra brand, but they went on to release these two additional models, circa 2000 and 2001, where as far as I can tell, that's when this lineage ended. So seven models sold over the course of five years by a fairly well-known tech company. It seems like a pedigree, and yet there's virtually no info about these things online, other than a couple of non-English websites from over 20 years ago that failed to even explain their feature set. I can't find any reviews in magazines. Nobody I show these things to recognizes them. So what happened to the creative infra drives? Well, to find out, uh, let's first see what makes these so unique. Although actually, we'll just be looking at the digital IR since the other one is exactly the same, minus one obvious feature. The elephant in the room here is the big black square under the disc tray. Even if the name hadn't tipped you off, it's clear this is an IR receiver. And that's the most interesting thing about this drive right off the bat, but let's finish the tour before we get into it, because there's more. If we compare to a couple typical CD-ROMs, you'll see that pretty much everything has been changed. Rather than the conventional one button or two button layout, we now have four buttons. And rather than the uh, usual volume potentiometer, we have volume buttons for the built-in headphone jack. Now, the two button CD-ROM layout was extremely common back in these days. And the way that worked was the eject button ejected like normal, but if you put in an audio CD, then you could press the second button and it would tell the drive to start playing the disc. And I don't mean in your operating system. I mean, you press play and audio starts coming out of the headphone jack on the front of the drive. Your PC is none the wiser. Independent audio playback was a feature in, as far as I know, all CD-ROMs ever made. They started life as audio players, so why not? The specs always demanded that they could do this. So even if a drive didn't have a play button or even a headphone jack, it still had the ability to play music and output it through a connector on the back, this guy right here that would loop over to your sound card where it would get mixed in with your PC's audio. This is in fact how almost all CD audio on the PC worked. When Command & Conquer started playing music, it was just telling your drive to play the track. It wasn't reading the data and decoding it in software. You can imagine this saved a lot of CPU time, especially in the 386 days. This also had the curious side effect that most CD-ROMs could be used to build a very basic stereo system. So for instance, I've got a power supply here. This is just a basic AT job, so it doesn't need any special signal to turn it on. Let's plug in power and get ourselves a pair of speakers. Plug into the headphone jack on the front. Turn our power supply on. It's incredibly loud. And now if we press the play button, there we are. We have music with no PC at all. And believe me, a lot of nerds realized they could do this. If you had spare parts for an old PC laying around and a garage with no stereo, then you could fix that real quick. But this isn't a complete CD player experience. Uh, for one thing, there aren't enough buttons. You can play a disc and you can skip tracks, but only forward. 
You can't go back and you can't pause, you can only stop. Now for a shop stereo, that's not that big a deal. And if you're, say, playing a game on your PC that doesn't have music and you just wanna have something playing, then the fact you can stick a disc in your drive, hit the button and listen to it, even if the game doesn't support CD audio, was certainly a nice bonus, even if you couldn't fully control it. Still, it'd be nice to have a CD-ROM that provided the rest of the CD player features, and Creative made big inroads on that. The first button here is the same. That's just your stop and eject. The second one's also the same. That's your play and skip. But then we have a third one. That pauses if you press it once, and it skips back if you press it twice. So let's see this one in action. Now, unfortunately, the drawer on this one is semi-jammed. Uh, if I try to eject it, it just does that and won't eject. And I thought at first that it was just getting hung up on the dried out foam rubber seal around the door, but I scraped all that off and it's still doing it. So something probably needs lubricated. I don't wanna risk damaging the drive by disassembling it though. So instead I just have to uh, kinda eh, help it open. I also have to help it close after inserting a disc because it just kinda stops there. So there we go. Anyway, we plug in our speakers and hit play. And there we are. So it plays, and as with the other drive, I can skip forward. But I can also skip back. There we go. Uh, and I can pause. And then when I resume, it's pause, not stop. So there you go. That's all the controls you need for a CD player. It's not as nice as having separate buttons for all the operations, but there isn't really enough room to fit them on the front here anyway. So this is a reasonable compromise. You know, it's a complete set of playback controls and just three buttons. That's pretty neat. And as far as I know, it's completely unique. To the best of my knowledge, these and the other infras are the only drives ever made that went beyond those basic two buttons. I have no idea why. It seems like a very obvious feature, but even companies that clearly gave a shit and tried their best to make distinct products never bothered adding that one extra button. I have no idea why. The uh, two button UI just seems like a weird cargo cult thing. Since even after Creative started adding these, nobody else appears to have caught the hint. It's just bizarre. Anyway, moving on, the fourth button here is labeled Turbo, and I can't demo that just yet because it only affects data reading, which we obviously can't do with this not in a PC, so I'll have to show that to you later. And finally, going back to the volume control, as I mentioned, it's a pair of push buttons. Uh, instead of the usual potentiometer that you have on these things, you can just roll back and forth. And this sucks, generally speaking. I hate digital volume controls. They're just a worse way of doing things. But this one has to be digital because otherwise you wouldn't be able to adjust the volume remotely. So yeah, about that. When CD-ROMs started shipping as standard hardware and PCs, it seems like maybe a lot of people would have stopped buying stereo systems, right? I mean, why bother? If you already have a fully functional CD player in your PC and your PC is running anyway, as they all were 18 hours a day by the late 90s, then why not just use that? Save a couple hundred bucks. Well, among other things, the user experience wasn't that hot. Obviously, the drive itself only had half your controls, usually, so you'd generally use a program like the Windows CD Player app, or later on Windows Media Player, to control playback. Those worked well enough, but you had to control them with your mouse, and that meant you had to be sitting at the PC. You couldn't be across the room. And worse, you had to actually see the app to control it. If you were inside a full-screen DOS program, for instance, or say, actually in DOS, which was still a thing in the late 90s, all you could do was reach down and hit next track or stop. You couldn't access any other controls. On the other hand, nearly every standalone CD player ever sold came with an infrared remote, so it could be operated from across the room. Now that was possible on PCs, there were remote control products, but they weren't common. In fact, while I can find a few mid-90s magazine articles about PC remotes, they only seem to talk about controlling presentations. There's nothing about media. So for all I know, you really couldn't buy a media remote for your PC in 1997. A few companies did sell complete systems that had remote controls, but they were usually big Baroque things like uh, Gateway's Destination that was built around an enormous specialized television set, or Toshiba's Infinia that was built around a chunky custom monitor as well. Microsoft also offered a very capable remote with their Media Center product, but that wasn't available until the early 2000s, and you couldn't actually buy it off the shelf. You had to get it with a complete system. So Creative, seeing that playing CDs without a remote was incredibly clunky, added one. And owing to my absurdly good luck with these things, 
I've misplaced it. Owing to my absurdly good luck with these things, I have one. I should mention, by the way, all these things are stupid rare. I've searched eBay for years looking for any of the infra models. Nobody has one. I don't think they sold very well. So while I learned these existed a couple of years ago, I despaired at ever actually finding one, let alone the remote, let alone the drivers. And then I was at RePC in Tequila, Washington, searching for a Windows Media Center remote for my Toshiba Cosmio video, and there was the remote in my hand. And at that moment, I also remembered that I'd been at the other store up in Seattle a few days earlier, where I saw the matching drive in a box of random junk, and I forgot to buy it. So I rushed back, hoping it was still there, and it was, somehow. <laughs> so I bought it, and then I had both parts, against all possible odds. And then I said, well, that's all well and good, but I'll never find the software for it. So I went to Internet Archive, and there it was. So I had the whole setup. <laughs> But even then, I, I wasn't too excited because in the meantime, I'd read up on this drive and I'd convinced myself that it wasn't actually that remarkable. I saw that it had the playback controls. That's neat, but is that worth a video even with the remote? You know, I have a hard time doing stories that aren't big in some way. This just seemed self-explanatory. Like, okay, someone had the idea of adding back the buttons and the IR receiver they took out of CD players in the first place. What is there to say about that? So I was just gonna stick this in a closet and forget about it, maybe use it in some retro machine I built someday. But then I got to looking closer at this remote. This is, of course, one of those uh, awful little credit card remotes that tells you, congratulations, you just bought an incredibly cheap device. These are the sort of things you get with like RGB LED light chains from AliExpress, and they're just hateful. I mean, they've got these awful little membrane switches. You can barely even tell if you've pressed them. A lot of the time it feels like you have, but you actually haven't. Uh, you can't really find your finger position on there or anything. They're just terrible. And this one's no better than the usual sort, but, I realized that it has a surprising number of controls. These ones up top in orange are the obvious front runners. You got your pause, play, stop, and whatnot for the CD-ROM. Then you've got mute and volume controls here on the side. So, you know, this is all the stuff you'd expect, but then what about the rest? We have a number pad and okay, maybe you could dial in specific tracks. I've seen CD player remotes that let you do that. But what about menu? What about the mouse button? What about the little tiny blue and white icons on each of these buttons? Those seem to be directional controls, web, home, print. I mean, what's going on here? Well, being a relic of the late 90s when useless web features were just as popular as useless multimedia features, this one supposedly offers both. It has the controls for your CD player and then it has web browser and mouse controls. Huh? I mean, one, what would these be? And two, how would they work? I mean, I think the first question speaks for itself, but as for number two, the drive has buttons on the front, nothing of note on the sides, and then on the back, it's an IDE interface. It's got power, analog and digital audio, jumpers. It looks just like any other drive. If we put these side by side, you can see they are basically identical. So even if controlling your browser from this dinky little remote made any sense on its face, how would it be possible? Where would it do it? There's no serial, there's no USB. The only connection to the rest of your PC is the IDE port, and that's just a storage interface. So how would the commands get to the software? Well, your first thought might be that this is kind of a cop-out, and that's what I thought at first too, because I dug up a manual for the infra remote and I didn't really see any mention of the CD-ROM. It seemed like maybe they thought that you might have a separate IR receiver connected straight to your PC. Even if this does work with the drive, you'd still point the remote at your PC, hit a button, and both the drive and your separate IR dongle would receive the same signal. So if it was a playback control, then the drive could interpret it. And if it was anything else, it'd get picked up by the PC and handled in software. And this hypothesis was reinforced when I found out about the Blaster PC. This was a short-lived product from Creative. It was a complete PC sold with a sound blaster, an integrated front panel IO, a volume control on the case, uh, possibly an FM tuner, and of course, a built-in IR receiver. Maybe if I had the full documentation for this drive, which nobody seems to have anymore, it would say that the rest of the features only work if I have an IR receiver for my PC sold separately. This is exactly the kind of outcome I'm used to with weird PC features. They end up being cheap hacks that are way less interesting than they seem on their face. So I was inches away from giving up on this thing, but first I decided to plug the drive in and test the remote and it didn't work.
We're powered up, and I'm gonna press play on the remote. Nothing's happening. So I'll start playing on the drive itself. Okay, so it's playing now, and I'm gonna hit stop on the remote. Nothing doing. I knew the remote worked because I pointed my phone at it and took a video. It's obviously emitting IR. I knew the drive worked because I could operate it with the buttons and IR receivers don't break. That's not a thing. So short of this somehow not being the remote for this drive, there's no reason this shouldn't have worked. So I got very curious and I thought maybe it needed to be in a PC. So I put it in one. Namely, this PC here, a Dell Optiplex GM5133. This is a Pentium 133 system uh, that was sold circa 1996. Uh, and I actually bought this separately from the drive. I just walked into RePC one day and it was there and I just grabbed it opportunistically. Uh, but check this out. Let's uh, take the case off here. This drive came with these very unusual rails on the side that I haven't really seen on anything else. Uh, but if I slide it in the front here, clicks right into place. So apparently, even though these came from completely different places, I bought them at completely different times, and this is also the only Optiplex GM5133 I've ever seen in my life, it appears that this drive was used in this or a very similar machine. Again, my luck on this project has been completely absurd. So I built up my PC here, I installed Windows 98, uh, installed the software I found on Internet Archive, I rebooted the machine and put a disk in, not expecting anything to happen. Press the button, and lo and behold, it actually works. In fact, it works perfectly. I mean, let's be clear, uh, as usual for every weird PC feature that I show off on here, it's not actually a very good product. The implementation is very rough in places, but everything it says it'll do, it does. So let's see that. So this is the infra software and it's kind of rude. When you install it, it puts this status bar up in the uh, upper left corner of your screen that's ever present, always on top, and it's gigantic. I'm running this thing at 800 by 600. So at 640 by 480, you can imagine this would dominate like a fifth of my display. And you could turn it off in the settings, but you wouldn't want to because it provides very important information. These icons indicate whether shift or mouse mode are enabled. And since those both change the functionality of the remote completely, you'd need to know. Uh, and the third one tells you whether it receives a signal in the default media control mode. So you can tell whether it's actually picking anything up or if you need to press the button five or six more times. So you definitely want these on your screen. I just don't get why they're so big. Eight by eight icons would have worked just fine here. But anyway, there's another very rude default behavior which I actually turned off so I could surprise you with it. I've just turned it back on and I'm gonna take this disc out and put it back in. Disc out, disc in. Media is audio CD. By Track default, one. the program announces every single thing that happens involving the CD-ROM. It tells you when the drive tray is opened. Tray out. It tells you what kind of CD you've inserted. Media is audio CD. And it tells you whether you hit play or change tracks. Pause, resume, track. Two. And it also plays a greeting every single time you boot your machine. Welcome. Thank you for using Creative Infra CD-ROM drive. And every time you shut down. Goodbye and have a nice day. These voice samples are incredibly loud and completely pointless. I mean, who wants their CD player to yell at them every time they press a button? There's no conceivable value to this, not even accessibility, since almost all the things you can do with a CD player already give audio and visual feedback. If the tray opens, you'll know because the tray is open. If you hit play, you'll know it when the disc starts playing. I mean, a repeat doesn't make noise, I suppose. That one would be useful to call out, but there's no repeat button on the remote. So this is the exact opposite of useful, and it's what designers come up with when they work on products that really don't offer much to phone home about. Imagine if you were developing this thing. It's an IR remote for controlling your CD-ROM. That's pretty underwhelming when you put it that way. That's been a finished product for like 40 years. So 
Someone had to have said, no, this, this needs more, more multimedia, more 90s, more computer, go back in there. And the designers sighed and went back in the meeting room and they didn't come back out until they came up with something more to add, at which point they'd lost the thread completely and forgotten how both CD players and computers were used. Fortunately, you can turn this off. Uh, and also fortunately, the enormous collection of WAV files that this installs only adds up to about four megs, so you can comfortably ignore them. Now with most CD-ROMs, uh, if you hit the play button on the front, it'll start playing the audio in the drive itself. It won't talk to any software on the PC at all. But with this one, if the software's installed, then even if you hit play on the drive, it still opens Creative's Infra software. The, this is the Infra Multimedia Deck, and it's one of those uh, delightfully skeuomorphic 90s apps that tries to look like a physical CD player. But unlike a lot of those, this one seems kind of reasonable. I mean, the controls are very small and hard to hit with your mouse, but they intended for you to use the remote for everything, so the local UI was probably lower priority. And making it tiny means that it can coexist with other apps. Even at 640 by 480, I'd be able to have this open, and also have something else open on my screen without having to uh, you know, pull it up on the taskbar in order to use it. It's also fairly intuitive. I mean, uh, the controls all work the way you'd expect. You got your you know, back, play, pause, stop, etc. cetera. Uh, the exceptions are volume, which turns out to be this little bar graph over here. It's kind of tedious to use. Uh, and then the uh, repeat and mute buttons, which are these over here. They look like indicators, but they're actually buttons. These are UI crimes, but I'll give them a pass. It's not that big a deal. Now, I should mention that Windows came with its own perfectly cromulent CD player. That's uh, this guy right here. And it kind of makes this look redundant because this does everything that InfraDeck can. I mean, there's just not that much to do with a CD-ROM, so that's not surprising. The only real thing that InfraDeck has that this doesn't is this set of uh, little numbers next to the display where you can punch in a specific track number to jump straight to it. The Windows player doesn't have that, but if we uh, close InfraDeck here so we can read the CD-ROM, you can just drop this guy down here and pick whichever track you want directly, which is, you know, just a better way to do it. Unless you're using a remote control, which is, of course, what this is designed for. Pretty much everything in the app can be done from the remote. So again, we can play. Track one. And we can skip forward a track. Track two. And we can skip back a track. Track one. On the remote, we can even scrub forward and back in a track, which is convenient. And of course, we can pause or we can stop. Finally, like I was saying, if we punch in a number on the pad here and hit enter, then it skips straight to that track and plays. Uh, the volume and mute controls on the remote also work like you'd expect, uh, and fortunately, those aren't specific to the CD player app. So if we uh, open up the system volume control here, when I press these buttons, you can see it actually adjusts the system volume directly, and when you mute, mute. it mutes the I whole see. machine. Now this highlights a fringe benefit of this product. The remote works as long as the software is open somewhere. You don't need to be able to see it. So for instance, suppose I'm playing a full screen game. Now this game has its own audio, but suppose it doesn't have a very convenient volume control. A lot of games didn't. Now, you could just Alt-Tab out and adjust the volume in Windows itself, but some games would crash if you did that. What you could do, however, was control them here from the remote. We can mute it, unmute, or we can turn the volume down or back up without having to get out of the game. In fact, we could even play a CD from inside the game. It doesn't blend very well with the engine noise, but it does work. And usually these were not things you could do on a PC before the days of keyboards with built-in multimedia controls. This is a pretty huge value add. I'll tell you, back in the day, I wished I had something that could do this, but I never knew this product existed, so I couldn't ask my parents to buy it. So far, this thing is looking pretty dope. I mean, even if you never played a music CD on your PC at all, it still got you a media remote that worked with all your software. And remember, all these features were available on that first infra drive back in 1997. Now back then, there wasn't a whole lot going on in the CD market. CD burners were rare and extremely expensive. I don't think DVD-ROMs even existed yet. So if you were going out to buy a new CD-ROM, you had basically 50 models that were essentially identical, and then you had this one. Why wouldn't you buy it? It seems like these should have been tremendously popular just on these features alone. But then we start getting into the other stuff it could do, which is 
disappointing at best and confusing at worst. For instance, we have the menu button. This just launches a quick start menu. Uh, by default, this only has three options. Uh, the first one, select active infra drive. That's uh, in case you have multiple creative infras installed, you can pick which one you wanna control. I tried using this to just re-pick the one I have and it hung my machine, so there's that. I don't know what else I expected. You can also launch the Infra Multimedia deck from here, although I don't know why you'd want to. Uh, it launches anytime you put in a disc or press play on the remote, so this is really pointless. Uh, and continuing with the theme of pointlessness, we also have Infra Web. If we select that, it just opens your web browser. I'll explain why shortly. It's actually doing something here, supposedly, just not something very useful. What is useful is that you can add your own arbitrary entries to this menu. So I added Winamp here. You can hit four, hit enter, and there we go, we've got Winamp. Now I've said before that when companies try and come up with new features to add to the PC, invariably the only thing they can think of are program launchers. Given that this is one you can control from across the room, it seems like it holds a bit more water, but what good is it to launch a program from the couch if you can't control it? And thus we come to the mouse button and that enables mouse mode. Once we're in mouse mode, if I press the arrow keys on these orange pads here, I can steer the mouse around the screen so we can work our way around here to the play button in Winamp and then press the left button to play. Left click. <laughs> it, it says left click every time you left click? Left click. That's awful. Right click. <laughs> I missed that when I was writing the script. God, that's terrible. Who would want this? Okay, so it technically works, but here's the thing. This is agonizingly slow. I mean, when I read about this feature, I was picturing that it would be pretty crappy, but that I'd press the button and hold it down and it would just like very slowly crawl across the screen. That would be irritating, but you know, sorta of usable. This doesn't do that. Watch, I press the button and it goes one hop and then stops. So you have to press it again, over and over and over and over and over and over to get from one side of your screen to the other. Huh? You could adjust the sensitivity, but I have it cranked here, and the biggest leap it'll make is 20 pixels, and honestly, that's actually kind of too big. You can easily skip over UI elements. What you want is to press the button, have it start moving, and then gradually ramp up in speed, and there's really no reason they couldn't have done this. If we look at the remote transmitter through my phone camera, you can see that when I press the button, there's a distinctive flicker. That's the IR signal that means mouse up. But if I press and hold, it sends a repeat signal after that, as long as I hold it down. There's no reason the software couldn't catch that signal and continue moving the mouse. It just doesn't, and that renders this feature completely useless. This is technically a remote mouse. You can't claim that it isn't. It has motion, it has left and right click buttons, but it's so tedious. You'd wear out the membrane in 10 minutes if you tried to seriously use this thing. I have no idea what they were thinking, but as shipped, this is an unfeature. The other mode button on here is the shift key. Shift lock. This enables all the little white icons on the numpad here, and these are your web browser controls. Uh, we have home, save page, print, go back, go forward, page up, page down, open browser, and reload. And I can't really argue with these, they work pretty much like you'd expect, but they work by injecting simulated keyboard shortcuts into your browser, and that's kind of a problem. For instance, uh, if I do page up and page down, those work okay. Page down, page down. And if I do reload, that works. Reloading. Okay, but suppose I try to go home. Home page. Yeah, it goes ding and then opens the help menu because this software was written for Windows 95 and Internet Explorer 3.0, and this is Windows 98 and Internet Explorer 5.0. I guess they changed the shortcut in between, so it just flubs it. And this really highlights a problem with this software. You can't redefine these keyboard combos. This really stings because if you could, then you could bind this to do other things on your PC and that would make this product instantly 500 times more valuable, but instead it's all hard coded. And that wouldn't be so bad if the thing it was hard coded to do was really doable, but it's not. Navigating a web browser with a remote sucks. Even web TV had to come up with novel remotes to make this remotely tolerable. Huh. 
Obviously, doing it by just moving the mouse cursor around five pixels at a time is out of the question. So your best bet is to disable mouse mode. Mouse mode off. And then what were the mouse movement keys become arrow keys that move the page around one line at a time. So that gets you something, but now you still need to uh, navigate between links. Well, the right mouse button becomes a tab. And so you can now tab between links on the page and press enter to select one. In practice, of course, this is agonizing. I mean, besides the fact that we have no method for entering text from the remote, so we're gonna have to use the keyboard to go to a page in the first place, once you're there, uh, okay, let me just show you. I'm on my website, cathoderaydude.com, and I wanna read my OS2 article. So uh, let's see, tab, one, two, three, four, five, 6, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 7, 28, 29. Okay, 29 presses and then I overshot it. And there's no way to tab back. There's no uh, way to shift tab on here. So we're gonna have to either continue tabbing another 30 or 40 times to go around the page and get back down to it, or we could mouse over there, but you don't need to spend 10 minutes of your life that way and neither do I. Graphical web browsers were meant to be operated with mice. Nothing else really works other than a touch screen, and this is pretty much the opposite of that. It is deeply inorganic. It's slow. You wear your fingers out pressing these awful little buttons over and over, and a lot of the time, presses don't even register because the software doesn't pull the receiver often enough. So it could take two or three presses before a page down actually happens. It is dire. But Creative wouldn't give up. Their first half-ass effort failed, so they tried to make up by quarter-assing it. There's supposed to be a digit navigation mode, and the way that works in theory is that if you press a number on the remote and it finds a link on the page that begins with that corresponding number, it'll follow that link. Now, this is supposed to be enabled when you select InfraWeb from the menu or press the web button on the remote, but I couldn't get it to work. Here, I, I made a page on my website uh, that has a couple links that begin with numbers. So I guess we would turn off shift mode. Shift unlock. And then press a digit and nothing happens. And even if it did work, I, I mean, what is that? <laughs> there aren't any websites that are structured like that. So this is nothing. This was never going to be anything. It is a perfect storm of uselessness. If the remote used rubber keys instead of membrane, it'd be a little bit better. If you could hold a button down to repeat an input, that'd be a little bit better. If there were letters on the numpad buttons so you could enter text, it'd be a little bit better. There are a dozen ways that they could have pulled this one back out of the fire, but as is, there is quite simply no way that anyone ever attempted to use this to operate a web browser. That did not happen. And I try to be kind to people who developed funky, failed products, but in this case, it's just pathological featureitis. This is a company that no longer had any remarkable products. They had nothing to keep them on the map and they knew it, so they built a hammer that was undeniably novel. They were very proud of it, but they could only find one nail worth pounding with it, and that wasn't good enough, so they went looking for something else, anything to add, but lacking money or imagination or both, they came up with this, and it's just nothing. And that's pretty much it for the product itself. This is what Creative shipped. And I can't say that these issues are why this product lineup seems to have been ignored and forgotten, but they certainly didn't help. Honestly, I think if you ship a product with one of these awful credit card remotes, you shouldn't ship the product at all. Because as soon as this falls out of the box, the buyer knows that they just bought crap. The only remaining notable thing about this software is that apparently there was some kind of API. I couldn't find any documentation on this, but either it was documented or someone reverse engineered it because there's actually an infra remote plugin for Winamp. I've installed that. So if we go back to the menu and start Winamp, then put this in shift mode, shift lock, then the playback controls up here become Winamp controls. We can play, pause, stop, etc. But I don't even think that was an intended feature by Creative. So that just leaves us with one question about these drives. What do these turbo buttons do? Well, I can't be 100% sure what the intent was, but it seems straightforward enough. Just like the button by the same name that we used to have on PCs, it does the exact opposite of what it says. You don't press it to make the drive faster, you press it to make it slower. 
Now I've rewritten this part of the script over and over. That's why I'm wearing a different shirt. I had to reshoot this part because I kept coming up with different explanations for this function. And that turned out to be partly due to the computers I'm testing with being so old that I got inconsistent results from benchmarks, but I wouldn't have needed to rely on testing if Creative had deigned to explain this feature. It's really tough to find any documentation for any of these drives, but even what I can find has really no excuse to be as threadbare as it is. Uh, this diagram of the Infra 4800 is the only thing I've ever found that mentions these buttons at all, and it doesn't even call them turbo. Apparently, Creative didn't adopt that term until the last couple models, these guys here. The Infra series just labeled it mode, and the legend simply says that it switches between normal and special modes. Special mode, normal mode. The only description of this special mode is that drive stability and disk reading capability are enhanced, and that means nothing. It's literally the only information I could find from Creative, though. I spent hours looking at old archived versions of their website, squinting at blurry old box photos, and trying to find anyone talking about these things on Usenet with no success. So the only thing I was left with was a quote from a Russian website, 3dnews.ru, I think it was. Uh, I had a machine translate this, but it seems to say that the button switches to a two-fold lower reading speed, which is very useful for high-speed drives and allows you to reduce noise and vibration as well as improve the quality of disk reading. Uh, so this seems straightforward enough. When CD-ROMs underwent their immense speed improvements in the latter half of the 90s, drives started spinning at absurdly high speeds. The original CD-ROM format only ran at 300 to 500 RPM, but the 40X and 52X drives that we eventually got ran at more like 8,000 to 10,000. CD-ROM media was just not designed for this, and the results were inconsistent. There are stories of disks actually exploding at these high speeds. That's pretty rare if it ever happened at all, but less dramatic failure modes were actually pretty common. For instance, a few years ago, I was trying to rip a Mad Magazine CD from 1996. I was in another room when the drive spun up to full speed, and when I came back, my PC was howling, my desk was shaking, and when I ejected the disk, it was hot to the touch. The surface was scored up, part of it was melted, and neither the disk nor the drive ever worked again. So one reason to slow down your CD-ROM was to read old disks without incurring property damage. But even newer disks that were safe to read at those speeds were still loud as hell. Suppose you want to go play a game. So you put the disk in, it spins up, and it sounds like this. You don't really want to sit next to that the whole time you're playing your game. But imagine that you could press a button on your CD-ROM and then it would sound like this. That'd be a little more tolerable, wouldn't it? So there's safety concerns, there's noise concerns, and finally there's error rates. If your drive or your disk aren't as high quality as you'd like, or your disk isn't in the best condition, then slowing down can reduce the chances of read errors. I can actually show you this in action. This is a CD benchmarking app which graphs rotational speed, the yellow line, against data transfer rate, that's the green line. I ran this test in special mode, so the speeds are reduced, and at the beginning, it's reading near the center of the disk where linear speeds are lowest, so it's only transferring at about 9x, and then as it proceeds, it moves further out towards the edge, the linear speeds increase, but the transfer only gets up to about 16x. You can see that the rotational speed here, again, that's the yellow line, is dead flat at about 4,000 RPM. That's a lot faster than the original CD-ROMs of the late 80s, but it seems to work fine. This is pretty uneventful. But here's another graph taken in normal mode. This starts out at 4,000 RPM, but then it accelerates to about 9,000 and almost immediately craters when it runs into some minor inconsistency. It does all right for the rest of the test, but that was on my fifth or sixth run. Let's take a look at a couple others. This one spins up, immediately craters. It reads a few megs, craters. Reads a few more, craters again. Then we have some clean reads for a bit, then another crater, then it plateaus, recovers, and then declines again near the end. Okay, now let's look at the test before that. I changed nothing here. I just hit test again, same drive, same brand new disk that I just burned. Look at this graph. 
It's a total mess. It's constantly losing track and having to spin down, spin back up, get a new running start. It was miserable listening to this drive struggle over and over. At its peak, when it's operating smoothly, this drive can read at 54X. But that's not much good if it can't get a clean read at all. Maybe I used a cheap CDR. Maybe the desk was too wobbly. Maybe the drive is just old and tired. Maybe it wasn't this bad when it was new. But the fact remains that the faster you go, the more likely you'll run into issues with media quality. The harder it is to read discs with dirt or scratches on them and so on. And even if the drive can get a perfect read, it might have struggled to actually hand that data off to your PC. When I first tested this on the Pentium machine that I've been using throughout this video, I couldn't get it to read any faster than 12X. And I pretty quickly found out that's because it was pegging the CPU. So I switched to a Pentium 3 machine and it didn't really improve very much. So I switched again to a Pentium 4 and things got better, but I still couldn't go much faster than 24X. It seemed to be hitting some kind of ceiling. When I moved to a much newer Core i7 machine, I was finally able to get the drive to read at something closer to its theoretical maximum. The benchmarks were inconsistent, like I said, but it hit 54X at least sometimes, and that never happened on the P4. This suggests to me that maybe the IDE controller on that machine couldn't handle the throughput. This doesn't make a lot of sense, since a contemporary hard drive should have been several times faster than any CD-ROM, but maybe it's something specific to CD-ROMs, who knows. At any rate, what it looks like to me is that when it tries to read in normal mode on the P4, the drive spins up to full speed, it reads a few megs, then it fills up some buffer on the IDE controller, it's told to slow down, and then when the buffer clears, it tries to speed back up, instantly fills it back up again, and that results in this ping-ponging back and forth. If I put it in special mode, however, I get a clean graph all the way from beginning to end because it doesn't saturate whatever it was saturating. And this might explain why Creative didn't call this turbo at first. When they were selling the infra drives in the late 90s, probably a lot of machines had problems like this. So they came up with a solution. Obviously, they didn't want to call it slow mode, so they just called it mode, vaguely, and didn't document it because they didn't want to admit that the speeds they advertised were, in practical terms, unachievable for almost everybody. I'm guessing that if you wanted to find out what that button did, you pretty much had to just call them and browbeat some support rep into admitting it. Once the 2000s rolled around, they maybe found that higher end machines could more often pull this off. Uh, the P4 machine I was using was actually a low end one, so maybe a top of the line rig in 2000 could actually keep up. So they changed the button to turbo because they were more willing to stick to their claim that maybe these drives could achieve full speed in practical use. They were more willing to bring attention to that fact and if you still couldn't, then Creative would just tell you that your machine wasn't good enough to deserve turbo mode and tell you how to turn it off. So that just leaves us with one question. How does the receiver on the digital IR work? It turned out there was no trickery. It really does talk to the software on your PC and it clearly does it over the IDE interface. But how is that possible? Now, I'm sure basic playback controls were part of the standard CD-ROM protocols, so if all this did was play, pause, and skip tracks, we could guess that it's just doing whatever the buttons on the front of any CD-ROM do. But since it has all the other crap, the, the mouse inputs and whatnot, then obviously some kind of shenanigan is going on here. And I admit that I can't tell you for sure what it is, but I think there's only one way it could possibly function. Here's the secret that makes this all come together. It is not quite true to say that these are IDE CD-ROMs. In fact, those don't really exist, depending on how you want to split hairs. IDE, or ATA as it's sometimes known, is specifically a specialized interface for PCs to talk to hard drives. That is the only thing it was ever meant to do, and all parts of the protocol are hard drive specific. In fact, the command format originally specified the location of data in terms of cylinders, sectors, and heads. It literally had you describe the physical structure of your hard drive. CD-ROMs store and deliver data in a very different format, and they require very different nouns. Which track do you want? How far into that track do you want to skip? Not in sectors or blocks, but in minutes and seconds. Verbs like open tray and play track don't exist in IDE. So for a while, PC CD-ROMs had to use completely proprietary interfaces. Uh, for instance, Creative's early drives only worked if you plugged them into one of their sound cards. But everything that wasn't proprietary used SCSI. Before USB came out, SCSI was the standard for high performance peripherals. Tons of stuff used it, like tape drives, scanners, and digital cameras. If you bought a slow, crappy consumer product, it probably connected over parallel or serial, but if you bought something expensive or industrial, it used SCSI because it was just better. So most higher end CD-ROMs switched to it, and that's where they stayed. 
So-called IDE CD-ROMs are in reality SCSI devices. They use an extension to the protocol called a TAPI that simply tunnels SCSI inside a special packet format. If you check under the hood, all operating systems see IDE CD-ROMs as SCSI devices because that's what they are. And the SCSI protocol is much more flexible than IDE. It uses a set of verbs called command descriptor blocks or CDBs. And while it does define some standard ones, there's plenty of room for vendor specific commands. Uh, for instance, you might make one that says, tell me the latest IR signal you've received. And the really beautiful thing about this is you don't need special drivers. Windows has an API called the SCSI pass-through interface that allows an application to send or receive raw SCSI commands. So you can just install a program and as long as it can find the device on one of the attached SCSI buses, it can talk to it. This is in fact how CD burning apps send special commands to your drive to configure and start a burning operation. So presumably all that's going on here is that creative software pulls the drive frequently and whenever it sees a CDB with a particular number that means it's an IR command, it interprets and executes it. And that's really all there is to it. It's neither remarkable nor cursed. This is actually the right way to solve this problem. Assuming of course that this is how they did it. I'd hoped to prove that, but I don't have a SCSI protocol sniffer. I could only find one software product that claimed to do this called BusHound, and it will run on Windows 98, but the trial version only captures a handful of packets, which isn't enough to prove anything. And the full version is $800, which I'm definitely not spending, especially since honestly, I don't think there's any chance to doing it any other way. There's just no reason to. So in the end, there are no real mysteries about these drives, except why they were the only ones. Why did so many vendors sell CD-ROMs with just that play and skip button and not just one more button so you could pause and go back? I mean, come on, that's just obvious. I don't think this was a stroke of genius on Creative's part. It's like the obvious next step. And while the remote, as implemented, might be trying too hard on the software side and not really trying hard enough with the hardware, I think the idea is very solid and I wish other vendors had had the same thought. Back in the 80s and 90s, it wasn't uncommon for PC add-ons to serve multiple purposes. Uh, back in the early 80s, for instance, when the PC was new, people used to buy cards that combined serial and parallel ports, a real-time clock, and even a game port all into one because a person who wanted one of those things probably wanted all the others. Likewise, when the first Sound Blaster came out, it included a game port, because if you're playing sounds on your PC, you're probably playing games with sounds. And they crammed a MIDI interface into it for the same reason. Composers buy sound cards. Why make them buy a separate piece of hardware to plug in their keyboard? IR receivers never became standard equipment on PCs, but then MIDI interfaces wouldn't have either if Creative hadn't shoehorned them into sound cards. So if they put these IR receivers on CD-ROMs back in 1994 and then sold a whole load of them, maybe other manufacturers would have made the reasonable leap that anyone buying a CD-ROM wanted their PC to have rich media capabilities, for which a remote is an obvious boon. But sadly, I get the impression that Creative just never marketed these hard enough for that to happen. I can't find any mentions of the infra or digital IR anywhere other than that one magazine ad I showed you earlier. And that probably has nothing to do with creatives marketing per se, just their marketing here. Unfortunately, my scope is pretty much limited to the US. And while I did buy both of the drives in this video locally, that doesn't mean they were meant to be sold here. Something I didn't really think about until pretty much now is that our local e-way stores receive a really unusual amount of Japanese market electronics. Uh, for instance, this Sharp Miramasa, a really thin early 2000s laptop that, as far as I know, was never sold in this country. At least this one wasn't since it's covered in Japanese text. This probably came over from Japan 20 years ago in somebody's luggage, and the same is probably true for my CD-ROM drives. Very late in editing, I was looking at an old archived copy of Creative's website, and I found text underneath the infra drives that says, available in Asia. I checked some other pages, and yeah, if it was sold here, it would have also said United States. Now, that was the 2000 page, not the 1997 page, but the point is that probably Creative didn't sell a lot of these drives in this country. They probably were reviewed and documented, just not in English. Oops. I don't think this diminishes my criticisms any. I think Creative missed the mark in a number of important ways, no matter where they were selling them. And in five years, they still could have iterated on something other than transfer speeds, like improving that awful remote. With that said, I still don't know why they didn't sell more of them here. I mean, even with the issues, they seem outstanding by the standards of the time. So if these really weren't a US product, I don't know why. And I probably never will. I just needed to let you know that I flubbed it a little. In conclusion, 
I'd say if you ever see one of these, you should snatch it up. It'd be a great addition to a retro computing machine, but chances are the only time you're ever gonna see one is in this video. So if you enjoyed this, please consider subscribing so I know you like this sort of thing. And if you wanna find out when I make new things, remember to turn on notifications because YouTube's really bad about that. But if you wanna make sure that I keep showing you stuff like this, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks here are doing. I make my whole living off my channel, uh, but it's a weird job. It involves a lot of wandering around at thrift stores and eBay, hoping to stumble on things I can show off. And sometimes I just have to buy stuff when I see it. My patrons make that possible and they pay for my groceries and gas in my car and fixing my plumbing when it blows up every six months. So I'm incredibly grateful to all of them for the support. Thank you all so much and to everyone else. Thanks for watching.